I love that at the beginning. Can we do that again? Howdy. Howdy. I love a and <laughs> I'm a Texas guy. I didn't get to come to Texas A&M, but I come through and visit every chance I get. I love your university. I love your spirit. It's just fantastic to be here. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Lightfoot for letting me be here. Thank you very much also to your, to your course director for letting me speak in this venue. And thanks to Dr. Kreider for uh, the support that he's provided as a department chair for this program. Um, the Texas chapter of uh, of the, the, oh wait, I can do this. <laughs> American College of Sportsmen, I'm a member, American College of Sportsmen. The Texas chapter does this really interesting thing. I've never experienced such a thing as a scientist where you do, I mean, I'm doing five universities in five days. So it's crazy, I've been all over the place and, and it's all in Texas and it all feels just wonderfully familiar and, and to finally get here and get to talk to you guys is great. Um, a couple of ground rules. This is a class. And I really like this. I'm used to teaching an undergraduate class about this size. And so one of the things that I always ask in class is if you have a question, if you hear me say something that doesn't make sense to you, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, raise your hand and ask. It's like, I, I didn't understand that, or could you explain that, or what does that word mean? And I would be thrilled to stop and talk. I promise you, if you have a question, there are 25 other people in the room or more who have the same question, and you're doing them a benefit. And it's also better, you know, because if, if I say something that doesn't make sense, then, you're, you know, other things down the road aren't going to make sense. And so, anyway, feel free. I'll be very happy to, to stop and talk about things. Um, another caveat, this is a pretty basic science-y talk. It's got a lot of real data in it. So I'll try to explain those data. Um, some of the focus is aimed, um, because I understand there's some physical therapy, or some of you are headed towards physical therapy or occupational therapy or maybe medical school. And so I've tried to focus this in a way that would apply a little bit to those professions. Uh, but it's really focused not so much on sports or not so much on injury, but on disease processes and on the ways that disease can cause muscle weakness in, in individuals. This is not going to be a big deal for you right now because you're young and healthy. But it is a big deal for some of your grandparents and perhaps for some of your parents. Um, as we age, chronic inflammatory diseases become more prevalent and it affects a huge part of the population in the United States. So let's talk a little bit about that and how it affects skeletal muscle. And then I'll show you a fair amount of information, just some work that we've done in the field and how we think about what may be happening to cause weakness. That's not the button. <laughs> Good. All right. So this etching by Vesalius from the 16th century depicts the major muscle groups in the human body in a wonderful and beautiful and artful way, I think. Um, all these diseases lift, listed here, plus others that I didn't bother to list, are what we call chronic inflammatory diseases. So congestive heart failure, COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's like emphysema is, is a major subgroup of that. Uh, chronic renal failure, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, all of these are chronic diseases. Chronic means that they last for a long time. You're sick for a long time. You don't just die quickly. And because you're sick for a long time, your body adapts to that illness. And one of the adaptations to that illness is muscle weakness. Now, we don't have time to talk about all these diseases in a single lecture and also talk about the underlying mechanisms. So what I'll do today is try to focus on this one down at the bottom, rheumatoid arthritis. So we'll start by talking a little bit about that disease. What does it mean? And then we'll talk about ways that that disease might make your muscles weaker. All right, rheumatoid is actually a fairly prevalent disease. About roughly 1% of the American population eventually develops rheumatoid arthritis. Um, maybe 70 million people worldwide have rheumatoid arthritis, so it's not trivial. Um, as you would guess from the name arthritis, it is primarily a disease of the joints. Your joints get inflamed, and that affects your ability to use your joints, your ability to move, um, and it also leads indirectly to muscle weakness. So you get bone and cartilage erosion at the joints, that's the direct effects, but these systemic effects on other organs include muscle. This is a picture that I uh, stole off the WebMD website 
which illustrates the primary effects of rheumatoid arthritis on an individual's hands. Um, you see that the joints are swollen here, and that deforms the fingers and the way the hand is shaped so that the fingers um, are positioned differently and that alters the way that they work. It's harder for you to use your hands. You're not as adept. You don't, aren't able to do fine motor control. But you notice even on WebMD, when you know one little picture about rheumatoid arthritis, and they bother to mention weakened muscles. So it really is a major part of the disease. This muscle weakness in rheumatoid patients has lots of effects on, in daily living. It really affects the quality of life and the way that folks are able to go about um, tasks from moment to moment. Job performance is profoundly affected. You can well imagine that if you're a pianist or if you do a lot of keyboard work or if you have to do manual labor, rheumatoid arthritis would really make it difficult. It affects the normal activities of daily living, your ability to carry groceries to your car, to pick up your grandchild or compromise. <coughs> This muscle weakness that occurs in rheumatoid also alters limb muscle function and it alters gait. So people walk funny. They aren't able to stand and sit as gracefully as you guys are able to stand and sit. And because they become more clumsy and more stiff in their joints, they're more likely to fall and have fall-related injuries, which in the elderly can predispose them actually to early hospitalizations and sometimes death. So it has it has effects on, on the, the lifestyle at lots of different levels for these folks. And if we could find a way to get around this muscle weakness or prevent this muscle weakness, it would greatly improve the quality of life and lessen the impact of the disease. These are real data, not from my laboratory, but from a paper that was published by Hallowell and Jackson a few years ago. And these are data from patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. And they measured two things in this graph, and I'll point them both out to you. Notice the bars on the far left-hand side. The light gray bar are data from control patients who were matched their same age, they were the same sex. And they made measurements there of the cross-sectional area in those people's arms, in normal healthy people's arms. So they measured the cross-section of muscle in this space using a technique called MRI. They made the same measurements in RA patients and if you look, the amount of muscle in their arms was a little bit less. What do you think? Maybe 10%, 12% less? So clearly the muscles are smaller, and that would make them weaker. But then they measured hand grip, where you use these muscles to squeeze. And what they found was hand grip is not just down by 10%. Hand grip here, force production, is way down, 50 60%. So it's not simply that the muscles are getting smaller, it's that the muscles that remain are not functioning properly. They generate less force. And this is the fundamental aspect of muscle weakness that we're concerned about. Not so much the muscles getting smaller, but keeping the muscles functional that people have in their bodies. All right, so area is down a little bit, force is down a lot, and that's our focus. Now, why could it be that these people don't generate a lot of force with their muscles? It could just be that their hands hurt, right? If your hands hurt, you don't squeeze hard. Or it could be that because their hands hurt, they haven't been doing a lot of exercise, and because you don't do exercise, your muscles get smaller and you get weaker. It just could be physical inactivity. But there have been epidemiologic clinical studies to address this, and these two causes here don't seem to explain the weakness that these people experience. Instead, it seems to have something to do with the chronic inflammatory condition that the disease causes. So let's talk in more detail about what this word inflammation means and what people have measured in rheumatoid arthritis patients. All right. <coughs> so when I say inflammation, I'm talking about two particular, it's a complicated picture that we could talk all hour about, but I'll just talk to you about two aspects of inflammation. One is some molecules that are called cytokines. Cytokines are proteins that signal your body's immune system to activate it. These are pro-inflammatory cytokines. And two pictures are shown on the far left-hand side, which are molecular models of really important cytokines. The blue one at the top is called tumor necrosis factor. So it's an important factor for fighting cancer, an important factor for fighting infections, 
The one below it is called interleukin-1-beta. It also is an inflammatory cytokine, which has a lot of the same effects. And both of those cytokines are up, they're elevated in the blood of people who have rheumatoid arthritis. So folks who study this, the rheumatologists, the physicians who study this and have studied this for a long time, have really thought that these two cytokines played an important role in rheumatoid. And now they're they are developing drugs which you will see on television. I've noticed on this trip in hotel rooms, I'll have ESPN on something, and you'll see these ads for Humira. That's one drug that is targeting this cytokine trying to prevent the effects of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, Humira is not targeted at muscle weakness particularly. They're looking to prevent the inf inflammation in the joints. But it points out the fact that that molecule is thought to be very important. All right, so you've got these two cytokines that are circulating in the blood. We think they come from the inflamed joints, but then they can act on other tissues because they're circulating in the blood. And then we also have lots of data to indicate that rheumatoid arthritis causes something called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is when you have too many free radicals in your body and your body can't deal with them and they start to damage and injure the molecules in your body. They alter the way that your cells work in, in your various tissues and can cause you to be sicker. So oxidative stress is probably the result. It's stimulated by cytokines and it causes damage to the tissues. Well, these two changes are linked in the clinical literature, they're associated with weakness, which, as we've already discussed, could be caused by atrophy, fancy word for muscles getting smaller, could be linked to muscle atrophy, and it could be linked to contractile dysfunction. This contractile dysfunction down here, that's what we're going to talk about. That's the focus, in part because of those data in that bar graph I showed you. From a functional standpoint, we think this is the major impact down here. So what I will show you are some data that link these cytokines, oxidative stress, and contractile dysfunction in skeletal muscle. We'll try to put those pieces of the puzzle together. Welcome, come in. <coughs> Working definition. So I've got some real card-carrying muscle physiologists in this room who are nationally known and they have very strong opinions about the words I'm using, so I have to be real careful here. So this is, for today's purposes, for this class, the working definition of contractile dysfunction is it's a reduction in fall, or, or sorry, a reduction in force per unit cross-sectional area of muscle. So less force for a given amount of muscle. Just means the muscle you've got doesn't work well. Another term for that is specific force, force per unit cross-section. So you'll see that on some of the graphs, and when it says specific force, that's what it means. Okay, so let's talk, these are data, from, now I'm going to show you some data from my lab, which explains why we care about all this TNF, oxidative stress, contractile dysfunction stuff, but these are, I mean, you know, as scientists, we care about stuff because we've seen it. Scientists look at other people's stuff and say, well, that's interesting, but if you see it in your own laboratory, you really care about it, right? That's how you know it's true, it's because it's your stuff. If it's their stuff, well, we'll see. All right. So let's talk about, about these, the relationship among these things, and let's do that by looking at data which help to explain what happens. All right, these are some of the newest data from our laboratory. They were just published this summer. They're from a guy named Sean Stasco. He's a PhD student who's finishing up. He is submitting his last manuscript, and he's submitting his revised doctoral dissertation this week, I hope. What you see in this figure are some data from an assay that we use to measure free radicals in intact living cells. This assay is applied to living tissue and when, it, when it's applied and loaded into the cells, it glows green based on the amount of free radicals that are in the cell. Lots of free radicals, it's more green. Fewer free radicals, it's less green. So here, buffer, this is a control condition, just a healthy muscle sitting in a buffer solution. This down here is a healthy muscle sitting in a buffer solution with TNF, that cytokine we talked about. And what you can see from these pictures is that this green down here is brighter than this green up here. More free radicals when the, cell, when the cells are exposed to TNF. So this sort of measurement can be done over and over and you get these paired comparisons. 
buffer, TNF, buffer, TNF, buffer, TNF. And what we find is every time we put P TNF in the bath, almost every time, that fluorescence is brighter than under control conditions. So it when you see something systematic like this, then it starts to, you know, maybe this is true. And it's turned out for us over the last decade or 15 years that it has been very reproducible. So this is the most recent evidence that TNF stimulates free radical production. Here are our original measurements in muscle, which are from a paper in the year 2000. You were just a twinkle in your parents' eye at that point. What you see over here is a graph that looks almost like the graph I just showed you from Sean, right? Same ball and stick thing, buffer, TNF, buffer, TNF, buffer, TNF. In this case, five out of six went up, one went down a little bit. But this sort of reproducibility is what has kept us interested in the phenomenon. And so this was when we first noticed that TNF causes oxidants to go up. In that same experiment, we also measured the effect of TNF on specific force. So we measured contractile function. This is what's called a force frequency curve. If you haven't had physiology, let me explain it to you. On the y-axis here, we have specific force generated by the muscle when you stimulate it at different stimulus frequencies. Low frequency is just a single pulse, like a twitch. And then up here, it's really high frequency, up to 300. With skeletal muscle, as you increase the frequency of stimulation, you increase the intensity of the muscle contraction, and therefore you increase the force. So higher frequencies, harder contractions, more force. So we measured the whole relationship in normal muscle, and then we measured the whole relationship in normal muscle exposed to TNF. You can see what happened. It knocked specific force down by 50%. This is a big effect. And this big effect happened in just an hour or so. So this isn't that we killed all the cells. It's not that the cells remodeled themselves or got smaller. This is some sort of dysfunction in the fibers. So we've got an increase in free radicals and we've got a drop in force. In science, those two things may be related, but not necessarily. You have to test to see if they're related. And we did that by interfering with the free radicals. We gave a drug to the muscle that you would get if you overdosed on Tylenol and went to the emergency room. They would give you this drug called N-acetylcysteine. It's an antioxidant. So when you give an antioxidant to try to prevent this, then we look to see what would happen to force. So this is what happened to TNF by itself. If we pretreated with an antioxidant and blunted the free radicals, force didn't go down very much at all. There's this much protection from the N-acetylcysteine that we gave, almost complete protection. So it showed us that most of the TNF effect was being mediated by these oxidants. So TNF was hitting the cells, the cells were making more free radicals, and the free radicals were screwing up muscle contractions somehow. We thought this was really interesting, and we've spent the last 10 or 15 years trying to understand that better. I won't show you all the data that we've generated or all the ideas that we've had, but I will point out to you a few relatively new observations we've made that we think are interesting that help us understand more about how the cell is behaving with the long-term goal, remember, of finding a treatment to cure this. What you don't see on this is that there are multiple, your body, your, uh, the, certainly in your body, more importantly in your muscle cells. Um, I smile because um, when I was in college, I used to sit at the back row, and I would sit at the back row because there was a wall back there, and I used to stay out late, and I used to work 3 to 11 at the hospital, and so I was always tired. And I would come in, and I'd sit at the back row, and I'd, and I'd go to sleep. And I'm so pleased to know that some things never change. It's fabulous. <laughs> Um, this antioxidant here, in acetylcysteine, is not selective for a specific pathway. It's a general antioxidant. And this assay is not specific for any particular oxidant. It also is a general, anti, uh, a general assay. So we know that free radicals are up, but we don't know what kind it is. And that matters if you want to stop it. <coughs> so we've recently done some experiments to try to figure out which free radicals are being stimulated by TNF. So here's the two major cascade. One is nitric oxide derivatives, so this is one type of free radical cascade. And here's reactive oxygen species, or it's a different free radical cascade. 
They're very similar to each other, but they're distinct biochemically. This is work, Dr. John Waller down here is the world's expert on this stuff, that so you've got authorities here at A&M who understand this far better than I do. But we tried to sort this out in the current setting by doing experiments to tease apart, is it one cascade or the other? We are particularly interested in nitric oxide. So let me show you some of the experiments that we did and the logic that we used. Here are two graphs. This graph on the left-hand side is a chemical experiment. We just had a beaker with some reagents in it. The reagents included that assay reagent that, that glows green, that detects oxidants. And we exposed that assay reagent to, to both reactive oxygen species here and to a nitric oxide donor here. And what you see is that both reactive oxygen and nitric oxide will cause that reagent to glow green. So that reagent detects both cascades at the same time, which is good for us. We want to know that. So if you come over here and you measure the green glow from that assay, under control conditions, you get a bar that looks like this white bar on the left-hand side. <coughs> if you exp under control conditions, if you expose the muscle to TNF, you get an increase. You guys knew that with all the little ball and stick graphs. Then you come over here and you give a drug that blocks the production of nitric oxide. And you measure the green glow, and you can still measure a green glow, so that means that there must be some reactive oxygen in there because you've blocked the production of nitric oxide. So then when you give TNF with a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, this drug prevents TNF from increasing. You've prevented this increase in free radical activity. This tells us that the free radicals are probably nitric oxide and its derivatives. They're coming from the enzyme which this drug blocks. So these data were interesting to us. It suggested this was a nitric oxide mediated response. But you can't just do one experiment and draw a conclusion. So we then went to a different assay that is very selective for nitric oxide. It doesn't detect reactive oxygen. If this is a nitric oxide response, then that nitric oxide specific assay ought to also show an increase, right? So here are those data. Oops, oops. All right, here, these data. Once again, this is the chemical experiment, beaker with just some chemical reagents. We put the nitric oxide detect a uh, nitric oxide sensitive compound into this beaker. We exposed it to nitric oxide and we got a nice big increase in fluorescence. We exposed it to reactive oxygen, nothing. So it doesn't detect reactive oxygen, it does detect nitric oxide. Then we loaded that same dye into muscle. Here's the control conditions with the nitric oxide detector. Here's TNF with the nitric oxide detector, big increase. So this reinforces the notion that TNF is stimulating nitric oxide production in muscle. Brilliant. And one of the things that scientists do, not so much because we want to, because it feels sort of like a waste of time, but if you don't do this, they won't let you publish your work and they won't give you grants. So you then do more experiments. You say, well, all right, fine. If it's nitric oxide, then we have to rule out reactive oxygen. We have to show more conclusively that reactive oxygen is not the player. <laughs> Um, let me come back to that. Let me, before that happens, let me show you about how, nitric how we think nitric oxide is modulating force, modulating contractile function. So these are force frequency curves again. This is a control curve. Here's with TNF. You get the drop in force like we've seen before. Over here, this is what happens. Here's the control curve. This dashed line is the control curve transcribed. And these open symbols here are TNF with nitric oxide production blocked. So if you block nitric oxide production, not only do you prevent the rise in free radicals, but you also protect force. This to us was exciting. And then if you do control experiments with an inactive drug, TNF still depresses force. So these data reinforce the notion that not only was TNF increasing nitric oxide, but nitric oxide was responsible for the fall in force. Now, what was I telling you about reactive oxygen? We have to go back and do that, both for the free radicals and also for the contractile function. So those data are here. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep getting ahead of myself. I really want to tell you about reactive oxygen, but I can't do that yet. One other thing before we go. 
Your muscle cells have at least two or three different enzymes in them that can make nitric oxide. And those are different enzymes. They're different molecules. If we're going to design a drug to protect your muscle, then we've got to target it to the right gene product. We have to decide which one it is. The enzyme that is most common in your muscle is called neuronal type nitric oxide synthase. And it's called neuronal type because it was first found in the brain in neurons. Your skeletal muscle fibers also express neuronal type nitric oxide synthase. It's present just under the cell membrane. And so that's the, the, the most prevalent enzyme in your muscle cells. And so that was the one we tested to see if it would maybe account for this. And what we did is we got some normal muscle here and we exposed it to TNF. And then we got some muscle from some genetically altered mice that don't express neuronal type nitric oxide synthase. These are knockout mice. And if they don't express this protein, then they don't really respond to TNF. So this tells us not only is it nitric oxide, but it's probably coming from this protein. And then we did the force frequency curves from them. Here are nitric oxide synthase deficient muscle. So under control conditions here you see the black symbols and then with TNF you see the white symbols and there's no change. So if your muscle cells don't have that protein, they can't make nitric oxide and therefore TNF can't depress force. And then over here we did another control experiment. Notice I keep showing you control experiments. In this control experiment, the question was, well, if you're missing this enzyme, nitric oxide synthase, maybe it just screws up the cell and so it doesn't respond to NO anymore. Maybe that's the issue. But that's not true. If you take nitric oxide deficient, nitric oxide synthase deficient muscle, and you expose it to a nitric oxide donor, you can still depress force. So the cell will respond to nitric oxide, but because it's missing this protein, it can't synthesize its own nitric oxide, so it doesn't get weakened by TNF. Let me stop at this point. Any questions? I've been talking a lot. I Question. I forgot a little bit of my muscle physiology. Could you tell me a little bit back how the nitric oxide is produced or the role that that plays? So the question down here from a very prominent scientist um, is review for us how nitric oxide is synthesized and the role that it plays. So it's a great question, Mark, and let me try to answer it in a succinct manner. Nitric oxide synthase takes an amino acid called L-arginine in the presence of some other cofactors, and it turns L-arginine into another compound called citrulline. And as it makes that conversion, it releases nitric oxide. So it synthesizes nitric oxide from oxygen, molecular oxygen. That nitric oxide is produced in response to a calcium signal, typically. So the fact that nitric oxide production is going up here suggests that TNF somehow is stimulating some sort of local calcium release near the enzyme. <coughs> and that's stimulating the rise in NO. We don't know at the molecular level how nitric oxide depresses skeletal muscle force, but we've known for a decade that it does. And we think that the part of the cell that is most sensitive to nitric oxide is the myofibrillar proteins. Beyond that, we don't have a good, a good understanding of how it works. Part of it may be through cyclic GMP, but we suspect a lot of it's a direct redox effect. Great question. I saw another question. Yes, ma'am. You said this, but I'm assuming you tested in mice is the mice picture, but was this also like tested in humans or was it just tested in? Fantastic question. Um, science goes way too slow. We're not there yet. So the question from this young lady was, um, have you done this in humans or is this just mouse stuff? And the answer is it's just mouse stuff. Um, most of the work that I'm showing you is muscles from mice that have been excised and studied in a bath. In some cases, we do the experiments in the mice. The long-term goal, you, you're scooting me straight to the punchline at the end of my talk, which is great. Um, maybe I could just cut out all the intermediate stuff. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're studying stuff here which we want to take to humans. And that's where we're, we're headed. Thank you. Um, other questions? Mike, can I? John. One small one. This is where I get scared, right? So here's the free radical guy, and he's got a question. Uh, the function of NOS often depends on its location. Yep. In, in your hands, in this model, did the location change from the seizure in the cell membrane? 
And it can move. It can move. Um, so Dr. Lawler understands nitric oxide biology and in-NOS localization very well. And there are lovely, elegant data from mice with muscular dystrophy. So that's a, another chronic disease that's genetic. And it causes this molecule, NOS to di be displaced from its normal location beneath the cell membrane. And it goes into the cytoplasm, sort of diffuses around probably the total amount of nitric oxide synthase. This molecule is diminished in muscular dystrophy. Um, we haven't looked to see whether acute TNF exposure alters this. So I don't know the answer to that. I would be surprised, but we haven't looked. I mean, some things are more dynamic than we think, and that's a great question. We haven't bothered to look. With this use, it doesn't take long for it to, go, to move. Yeah. 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 So that's a great question. Um, let's see, we've talked about this one. We've talked about this one. Anything else before we go on? I keep thinking that we're going to get to talk about reactive oxygen, so maybe we can do that on the next slide. I'll see how this plays out. Yes. <laughs> so this came as a shock to us. We, this took us a while to absorb. It turned, it's, we knew that nitric oxide was responsible, right? So this was just a negative control experiment. We were going to rule this out and publish the paper. Instead, we couldn't rule this out because it turns out reactive oxygen are also essential for the TNF-induced weakness. Let me show you the data that convinced us of that. On this graph, this is general oxygen activity. So this is that original assay. It detects free rad both ROS and nitric oxide. Here's the TNF-stimulated big signal with TNF. Under these conditions with TNF in the bath, if you have these enzymes down here that selectively degrade ROS, so you deplete reactive oxygen, you can depress the total oxidant activity. That's OK. We knew that there were ROS in your muscle cells right now. There are ROS in there all the time. So this just shows you that there are reactive oxygen species in TNF-treated muscle. No surprise. This is the nitric oxide-specific assay that you've seen before. When you do deplete reactive oxygen, that doesn't stop TNF from stimulating nitric oxide. It still stimulates nitric oxide, which should still depress force, right? Uh. But it doesn't. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> it is really great being laughed at by your colleagues. <laughs> That's because he gets the joke. When, when you come up with data like this in your lab, it's like, oh, really? It's like, how does that work? This is, this is the, really the fun part of being a scientist, is when you get answers you don't expect. So it turns out that the reactive oxygen that are present in your cells all the time are important for the TNF effect. And so is this rise in nitric oxide. So how does that work? Here come the red blocks again. Here's a very simplistic diagram of a skeletal, part of a skeletal muscle cell. This horizontal line right here is the cell membrane. These little boxes right here, these are places where the cell membrane invaginates into the cell and carries, electron, uh, carries action potentials. On this side of the diagram, we've got all the different pathways, not all of them, but we've got some of the pathways that generate reactive oxygen and nitric oxide. And on this side over here, we've got the, the cellular components that regulate muscle contraction. So we've spread them out like this so we can talk about them separately. All right, so you already know a lot of what I'm going to tell you. We already know that TNF, in order to stimulate weakness, NNOS has to be present, and it has to make nitric oxide. We know that. We also know that reactive oxygen species over here have to be present, that somehow both of these have to be present. How can that be? Well, there are probably several different possibilities, and we haven't sorted this out yet. But our current working hypothesis is that these two families, these two cascades, are reacting to form a very specific molecule at this point, which is called peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite is abbreviated this way. It is a highly reactive species that requires the interaction between superoxide anions and nitric oxide. They react with each other. They form peroxynitrite, and peroxynitrite then reacts with the first thing it encounters, highly unstable, highly reactive. We think that for TNF to cause contractile dysfunction, it may be forming peroxynitrite, and it's the peroxynitrite that is the mediator. Now, 
that's great. We got a little bit of information on the right-hand side of the diagram. What about the left-hand side of the diagram? How is all of this compromising the contractile process? So to test that, we've been, we've been looking at data from intact, isolated skeletal muscle fibers. That's this thing. So this is a single cell from a skeletal muscle, in this case, mouse skeletal muscle. We study these individual cells because you can attach them to force transducers and you can measure force. And also, you can load them with a dye that will measure calcium. So that allows us to look at what the myofibrillar proteins are doing. Are they generating force? And to look at what calcium regulation is doing up here. We can look at the two parts of this separately. So here are force measurements from two cells. Here is a muscle fiber on this side. It's stimulated electrically. This is time down here, not frequency. It's stimulated electrically at mm, probably 60 or 80 hertz. And what you get is a rise in force. Then when the stimulator goes off, force relaxes. That's a single little contraction by this muscle cell. This dotted line is the same muscle cell four hours later. And it shows you how stable the preparation is. There's a little bit of creep a little bit of, of, of loss of force, but not much. It's pretty stable. <coughs> this is a second muscle fiber that's been exposed to TNF. So here it is at the beginning of the experiment before the TNF. Here it is at the same time as this, but with TNF in the bath. And what you see is that the force has fallen more with TNF than without TNF, consistent with all the other data I've shown you. This is that contractile dysfunction at the cellular level. So far, this is not really news, right? We haven't learned anything new. We know TNF depresses specific force. But now we have calcium data to go with. These data are from these two contractions right here. The solid line is the calcium transient during stimulation of that control fiber. It comes up, calcium stays stable, and then the stimulator goes off and calcium comes down. You come back four hours later and you stimulate the same cell and the dotted lines are exactly the same. So the calcium regulation has stayed stable in this cell. In the TNF cell, is this because there's less calcium or not? Not. Solid line was at the beginning of the experiment. Dotted line is after TNF. And if anything, these dotted lines are a little bit higher. So we've got at least as much calcium, maybe more calcium. And despite that, force has gone down. This tells us that TNF is acting downstream of the calcium signal. Somehow the cell isn't responding to calcium. That means the myofibrillar proteins are somehow not responding to calcium because of TNF, which we think is acting through peroxynitrite. All right. You remember I told you we thought peroxynitrite was the bad guy? Part of the reason we think that stems from data in the literature from colleagues of mine and John's, a group, Jerry Sapinski is the guy who did this work when he was at Case Western. What he did was he looked at fibers like this. that had, he, had, he took the membranes off. They're called skin fibers. You take the membranes off. You destroy calcium regulation. You just look at the myofibrillar proteins by themselves and you expose those proteins directly to however much calcium you want. And that way you can measure what the myofibrillar proteins are doing. He did those experiments in normal muscle fibers here. So he exposed them to higher and higher levels of calcium and force went up. As force went up, it reached some maximal level at high calcium concentrations. So those are normal skin fibers. And then he took some other skin fibers and he exposed them to peroxynitrite. And when he did that, and he exposed them to calcium, they generated less force. That's kind of consistent with what I just showed you, right? Less force in the presence of peroxynitrite, with peroxynitrite acting on the myofibrillar proteins. Well, if that's how TNF works, then we should be able to take skinned fibers from TNF-treated muscle, because we think TNF is causing peroxynitrite. So the TNF-treated skin fibers should look like this. And they kind of do. So here are those data. This is from a guy who was a grad student with us a couple of years ago. 
Brian Harden. These are normal skin fibers that have not been from mice that weren't treated with TNF. These are from mice that were treated from TNF, with TNF. And you see they look pretty similar. So these sorts of comparisons lead us to think that maybe that, nitric, that peroxy nitride hypothesis is OK. At least it's consistent with these data. So this is how we think of the system right now. We think TNF is stimulating an increase in NO production. In the presence of reactive oxygen, it creates peroxy nitrite, which acts on the myofibrillar proteins, and then they don't work so well. Now, the next place you go with this as a scientist, you say, OK, fine. What protein is it acting on? How come these proteins are, are not functioning properly? Because you can see from all these little balls and sticks down here, there are a lot of proteins in the myofibrillar lattice. And so that's the area that we're currently poking at right now. Here are some of the mechanisms that could be responsible. It could be direct redox effects on the proteins, either carbonylation or nitration or thiol oxidation. Or it could be indirect effects via acetylation, ubiquitination, phosphorylation, complicated signaling pathways that would modify the myofibrillar proteins. And you have to take all these things and study them separately. Let me show you some positive results. Yeah. So these are original data. You take a gel and you, you isolate myofibrillar proteins and you run them out on the gel against an electrical gradient. And you get these different bands based on how big the proteins are. Big proteins are up here, little proteins are down there. And you stain the bands and you can see where the proteins have gone. And if you work with a really smart biochemist like I get to do, that person can tell me what all these bands are and we can look to see if they're different. This is an assay for phosphorylation. And what you see here are asterisks on two of these proteins, myosin binding protein C and beta tropomyosin. And then if you, uh, and then if you measure, actually measure the intensity of those bands and you average the data so you've got a real population, then you can see there are systematic changes. Both of these proteins are showing more phosphorylation with TNF. So that might, we haven't proven anything, but that might contribute to this drop in force. These are the sorts of experiments we're pursuing now to try to understand better what the mechanism is. OK. <coughs> so what I'm showing you now is the punchline from mostly published data. We're sure that TNF stimulates nitric oxide production. We know that specific force is being depressed. We think peroxy might, nitrite might be, at least it's an attractive mediator. And we are pretty certain that myofibrillar proteins are the targets. <sighs> Right, but Dr. Reed, weren't we talking about rheumatoid arthritis? What does this have to do with rheumatoid arthritis? Good question. That's exactly the sort of question that the National Institutes of Health ask when I go to them and I ask for money. So I have to tell them that I'm going to take this basic science done in mouse muscles and somehow get it back to patients, take care of our grandparents, right? So how do we do that? The next step in this process is to develop a mouse model of rheumatoid arthritis and see if these sorts of things are happening in mice that have rheumatoid arthritis. So that's what our current grant is for. So the, these are new studies. They aren't published. Nobody in the world has seen these except for four other universities in Texas. <laughs> We've got some mice that look like this. It's a C57 black background. And we in, inject them with collagen in their joints. And they develop collagen-induced arthritis, which is currently the most accurate model in mice of rheumatoid arthritis. When you do that, you can then take muscles out. This is from soleus muscle. It's in the back of your leg. It's a postural muscle. You use it when you're standing up. Took it out, stuck it in a muscle bath, do a force frequency curve. This is absolute force, total force. You see here's the total force of healthy soleus muscles. Here's the total force of soleus muscles from mice with arthritis. It's way down. This total force could mean that the muscles have gotten really small, and therefore they make very little force. Or it could mean that they are having contractile dysfunction, that they don't function properly. <coughs> Turns out it's a little bit of both, but mostly it's dysfunction. So if you normalize these data for cross-section and you turn it from absolute force to specific force, here's what the data look like. Here's specific force in normal muscles, specific force in the rheumatoid arthritis mice. And look, this is a 50% drop in force, mostly. 
This looks exactly like the TNF data that we published in 2000, right? It's the same drop in the force frequency curve that we expect from TNF. So this is exciting for us. This looks a lot like what TNF does, and it looks a lot like the dysfunction that happens in patients with rheumatoid arthritis trying to do hand grip. It's about the same drop in force. So this shows us, this, this is a muscle in a bath. No nerves connected to it, no blood flow connected to it. This is not because the mouse, the mouse is, is expressing, is having pain and can't contract its muscle. We've taken all that out of the loop. This shows you that the muscle itself is screwed up. This is a comparison among mice. And what we have down here, this is the total arthritis score. As you come over here, it's worse and worse arthritis. You can measure that in the mice based on the swelling and other, and other indicators of arthritis. And here's force of the muscle. And what you see is as the disease gets worse, these are mice that don't have any arthritis up here. As the arthritis gets worse, specific force falls. It's kind of interesting, right? That's kind of what you'd expect in a disease. As the disease gets worse, the muscle is more affected. We're using this mouse model to try to understand what the mechanism is. You remember I told you about interleukin-1 beta way, way back there a long time ago, the first or second slide. We think that this is an important amplifier molecule. We think TNF in the blood is stimulating the muscle cells themselves to make this protein, and this protein is having an additive effect. It's a two-hit thing. TNF comes in. It causes some of the problems. It stimulates the expression of this. This amplifies the TNF effect. Part of the reason we think that is the data from this mouse model. This is mRNA for IL-1 beta in the gastrocnemius muscle. So that's back here. And here you see there's a little bit of IL-1 beta. Here you see there's a lot of IL-1 beta when you have arthritis. If you take a different muscle, this is diaphragm. Your diaphragm, right? Everybody take a deep breath in. You did that before you said, howdy. Well, the muscle that you use to take that breath is your diaphragm. And even though it's a trunk muscle, it also is affected by arthritis. The arthritis is down in the paws of the mice. This is in the thorax. It reinforces the notion that rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease. It doesn't just affect the local muscles. It affects muscles throughout your body. So you get this increase in IL-1 beta. Why do we care about IL-1 beta? Because IL-1 beta can stimulate nitric oxide production. So here are some experiments that we've done in a cell culture system. These are cultured muscle cells. So it takes all the other cells out of the picture. No inflammatory cells, no leukocytes, no other cells, just cultured muscle cells. We expose those cultured muscle cells to TNF, and they make more IL-1 beta. So this reinforces what we saw in the mice, and it tells us it can be a direct effect of the TNF on the cell itself. And then, when the IL-1 beta goes up, see, IL-1 beta goes up. Oh, sorry. IL-1 beta goes up in these myotubes. Oh, no. This was direct exposure to IL-1 beta. Sorry. Direct exposure to IL-1 beta causes this nitric oxide assay to intensify. So IL-1 beta will stimulate nitric oxide production. These data are consistent with the notion that TNF acts on the muscle, the muscle makes more IL-1 beta, and the IL-1 beta amplifies nitric oxide production, contributing to the loss in force. These are pilot data. We're not sure about this yet, but it's the model that we're working with. All right, so here's how we think about the system at present. We think that rheumatoid arthritis increases cytokine stimulation to the muscle. TNF is circulating. IL-1 beta, we think, might be a local amplifier. The cytokine stimulation then acts on the cell to, to cause oxidative stress, mostly by increasing nitric oxide, but ROS have to be present. The oxidative stress then causes contractile dysfunction, probably on the myofibrillar proteins, although we're going to go back and look at the calcium regulation as well, because you can't rule that out without doing the experiment. And this contractile dysfunction then leads to the muscle weakness that patients experience. If the things that I'm telling you are true, we can then go in and intervene with drugs in the mice 
We can block this part with drugs. We can block this part with drugs. We can block this part with drugs in mice. And if we use drugs that are approved for use in humans, we can then take those same drugs to the clinic and give it to rheumatoid arthritis patients and see if it helps them. So here I'm summing up. Here's what we think about cellular, this is the, the current research, sort of the future directions, where we're going, what we're currently doing. We're trying to understand the relative importance of TNF and IL-1 beta. We're trying to understand NNOS as a mediator. We'll have to go back and look at localization. And we're trying to understand the post-receptor signaling events. How does TNF talk to NNOS? You know, what's that link? We don't know. And we're trying to understand that. Mostly we want to start doing translational research. The sooner the better. It, we asked NIH to give us some money. They said, not yet. Show us the mouse data. So we're doing that. But we want to understand human relevance. We want to develop interventions in mice that we can then take to humans as therapeutic interventions. So that's the end of my story. But I can't, uh, no scientist can quit because no scientist does it by herself or himself. You can't quit with a talk without thanking the people who make it possible. In my case, I'm hugely thankful to these individuals, my colleagues and my friends, who generated the data that you've just seen. These are the people who generated the beautiful fluorescence assays, the biochemistry, the contractile function. Um, these are, this was my lab group at the University of Kentucky. This is our laboratory jackalope. This is our mascot. You had to be in the photo. We were supported by two different institutes at the National Institutes of Health, both the uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, because this work we think is relevant to congestive heart failure, and also by the National Institute for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Diseases. So thank you very much to these folks, and thank you guys very much for your attention and your questions. Appreciate it. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. So, questions. so we have a moment or two for questions. I know you've probably got other classes to get to, but if you have questions, I would be thrilled to answer them. I've got a couple questions. Please. Um, if you look at the effects of chronic exercise training, it often reduces TNF-alpha and other markers of inflammation. Yep. Have you considered the effects of training adaptations? That's the first question. Yep. And the second question is, we have some uh, top researchers, Dr. Duke's group, Dr. Anglin, have done a lot of clinical applications of situin yep. in preventing loss of muscle in patients. Yep. Have you thought about some of those applications that might be? So, um, so the question from Doc, two questions from Dr. Kreider, both of which I don't know the answer to. Um, one question was, how does this work relate to chronic exercise adaptation um, in muscle and whether or not TNF and free radicals might be playing a role in that and how those changes would relate to these changes. Um, depending on the sort of exercise training that we're talking about, if we're talking about strength training, particularly strength training, um, you get local inflammatory responses in the muscles that are being trained and you get increases in, in cytokine expression locally, sometimes you get influx of neutrophils and white cells, you get oxidative stress in the low, so it, especially with eccentric exercise, those of you who are athletes or who are trainers, you know that, that when you're doing uh, strength training, the extension movement is not really what builds muscle mass, it's the eccentric part. When you do active lengthening, you allow that weight to come down, that's usually the major stimulus for, mu for increasing muscle size, and that in part is because it tears up the muscle cells, and muscle has cells have to re repair themselves. So you get this response that lasts, I don't know, 48, 72 hours, where the cell has to re repair itself, and the signals for that repair include cytokines and free radicals, and so they're important in a positive way. But if you keep doing that over and over, the muscle becomes resistant to oxidative stress, the muscle depresses its own TNF levels, and so it, you know, over time it adapts in a way that makes it more resistant to this sort of disease. In terms of the citrulline experiments, I think those are fascinating experiments, and the point that Dr. Kreider is making is really relevant because citrulline, you remember I said that nitric oxide synthase generates nitric oxide from L-arginine and it produces citrulline. So you could think about nitric oxide synthase as a citrulline generator. 
And there are people who are at this institution and other institutions that are looking at citrulline as a drug that could improve muscle or protect, preserve muscle mass and function in sick folks. I don't know the link between those. I mean, I, I just don't know yet. It's an interesting question, fascinating. It's just not something we've worked on. Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, I have a question for this. Um, nitric oxide can often be seen as a bad guy or a good guy. It depends on the situation. And a lot of studies have been done, for example, in chronic inflammatory diseases like cystic fibrosis. Maybe it's, uh, nitric oxide is just an important guy for rehabilitation. Uh, recently, also more research are going on in with respect to the muscle that NO might also be important for facial dilatation, and in this way, it might improve muscle function. So, that's a good thing, and for sure, what's coming about the bad side of NO is also a good side of NO with respect to muscle function. That, I didn't hear a question. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> I mean, the, the facial dilatation part of NO, which is also important in the chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, so for example, when you have low but, level of NO. So I understand about NO as a vasodilator, but I'm not sure I understand the, is there a question? Yeah, my question is there are more and more uh, indications that, for example, when you give arginine during exercise, it might also have a positive effect on muscle function in patients with chronic inflammatory diseases. And then more related to phase dilatation. Well, l let me comment a little bit about free radicals as whether they're good guys or bad guys. And the answer is yes. <laughs> they are, both nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species are essential for normal muscle function. They play complex roles in modulating cellular function, not just the muscle fiber, but the smooth muscle next to it and the endothelial cells next to that function as a unit. And these molecules diffuse among those cell types pretty freely. So it's a really complex interaction, and it is essential, fundamental to normal biology. So under these conditions, nitric oxide is mediating the contractile dysfunction. Now, we think that's bad because we want to pick up groceries. But from an evolutionary standpoint, it may be that if you've got a chronic disease, your body wants you to sit down and quit, you know, quit running around and playing soccer, sit down and relax so that your body can respond to the inflammation. So you can imagine that actually the contractile dysfunction, the loss of muscle protein, are adaptive responses from an evolutionary standpoint that would be beneficial, right? So good and bad are actually not biological concepts. You know, they're, they're not, my, my, our cells aren't moral beings. And we tend, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not in any way discounting your question. It's a very important question. In fact, the talk that I gave yesterday at Baylor focused on exactly that. Are reactive oxygen species good guys or bad guys? That was, I think that was part of the Huffines discussion talk that I gave a few years ago. And we tend to think free radicals are bad guys and antioxidants are good guys, but that's not true. If you scavenge reactive oxygen from a normal healthy muscle cell, you paralyze it. It doesn't work without hydrogen peroxide in it. And then if you let it rebuild its hydrogen peroxide over the course of minutes, it'll get better and it'll contract again. One of the problems with antioxidant supplementation that athletes think about, right, so we're thinking about muscle adaptation and free radicals and are free radicals bad guys? It turns out that there are growing report, growing number of reports which indicate that if you over supplement on antioxidants, you can impede training responses in exercise. So the point you make is, is absolutely spot on true. From a biological, certainly a physiological perspective, these two free radical cascades are important parts of cell function. And just like any other parts of the milieu, acid, for example, or temperature, for example, or water, any of them in excess can be deleterious to cell function, and any of them and the absence of any of those things will also be deleterious to cell function. So I think that balanced viewpoint is actually really important. So thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? If there are other questions, let's uh, thank Dr. Reed again. For